this is the last conversation of our series about Italian top manager in U.S. companies, and is dedicated. We we opened the series. Some of you could rem remain it, uh, remind it with uh, Luca Maestri, CFO of Apple, and uh, the last thing, conversation is dedicated to Mauro Poccini, Chief Design Officer of PepsiCo. Uh, we'll be in conversation as in all other occasion with Maria Teresa Cometto organized with us this series and I have to thank again her for his beautiful work. Mauro Pacini joined PepsiCo in 2012 as its first uh, chief design officer. In this newly created position, Mauro is infusing design thinking into PepsiCo's culture and is leading a new approach to innovation by designing the impacts the company's product, platform, and brands, which include Pepsi, among the others, Caterade, Tropicana, Doritos, and so on, hundreds of others. Uh, his focus extends from physical to virtual expression of the brands, including product, packaging, events, experience, advertising, retail activation, architecture, and digital media. Among the several recognitions received in the past years, uh, Fortune magazine listed him in the 40 under 40 ranking, its list of the business hottest rising stars, the only de designer included. At age, uh, name him in their Creativity 50, its list of the world's most influential creative personalities. Uh, Fast Company recognized him as one of the 50 most influential designers in America and Master in Design of 2011 and the in it Italy America Chamber of Commerce and has awarded him with the Business and Culture Award, a recognition given every year to one Italian that has performed in an extraordinary way in the US in the fields of business and culture. And also was awarded at the um, last uh, gala dinner of the Scuola Italiana here in New York. And okay, I think it's enough. Um, prior to joining PepsiCo, he served as Chief Design Officer at 3M. Enjoy, Mauro Puccini and Maria Teresa Cometto. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, thanks for, for the invite. Um, I've been trying to explain to my mother for the past 20 years what I do, and she still doesn't understand it. <laughs> she started to understand a little bit when I, when I went to Varese uh, and I gave a speech in Italian, because she doesn't speak English, and I show projects, and then she was like, oh, now I understand a little bit more, but still she's trying to figure it out. Well, I think there are two questions here. The first one, the, the second one about what's on the wall, um, well, you know, every word has a very important meaning in that in those sentences. In that sentence, um, crazy means that we want to think differently, differently from uh, the normal status quo. We want to challenge that kind of status status quo. Um, inspire talks about the fact that uh, before anything else, we need to inspire our own organization, our customers and then consumers to come with us. If you are able to inspire people through your action projects, brands and products, then you can really change things. Uh, and then we go from the products that are the most important thing that we do at the end of the day. We really need to create something that has quality for people to answer specific needs, wants, dreams of people and society. Uh, then you overlay a brand on top of it. If you do the right thing with products and brands, then you really can grow your company. And finally, with companies of this size that impact the life of so many people, if we really uh, increase the quality of what we do and the way people interact with our products and brands, we can impact the society as well. And this is, I think, is something beautiful that uh, these kind of companies uh, give us, this opportunity to touch the life of billions of people around the world. Um, what they do... <laughs> is <laughs> um, a new job. It, is a, it didn't exist in PepsiCo before I joined, but it doesn't exist in, in corporations in general. There are very, very few corporations with this um, kind of uh, role. Uh, 
Um, and the reason is that the world is radically changing very recently. Uh, and these companies were growing with a model, especially in CPG, the consumer good companies, were growing with a model where essentially you had very strong products uh, with not much competition the most of the time at, of that size. Uh, and then you were growing those brands through campaigns, yearly campaigns, and therefore a company like PepsiCo would attract the best marketers of the world because everybody wanted to come here and do uh, the halftime show commercial, you know, those prestigious Michael Jackson, uh, Cindy Crawford kind of commercial that make history of, of marketing and branding. Uh, then you were working on the products, but in a sort of incremental way. So in our case, uh, new flavors, um, more or less calories, working on reformulation of the existing products. And when you wanted to really innovate, you will acquire companies. Um, we live in a world that is completely different. Essentially, uh, these big corporations don't compete anymore just with other big corporations, but they compete with a series of new entrants, of startups uh, that arrive from everywhere uh, that you may be aware of because they're out there right now, but there are so many that are about to come. Uh, on Tuesday, I was giving a speech for uh, Time Magazine and Fortune uh, together with Joe Gabbia, that is the inventor, the founder of Airbnb. And when they asked me a similar question, my answer was, I exist, my role exists, because Joe could create Airbnb and disrupt the hotel business, for instance. So this is true in every business. Uh, you had Starwood and Marriott and Hyatt, they were competing with each other, and then all of a sudden arrive a kid that happened to be a designer, Joe is the designer, and creates Airbnb and disrupt that business. Uber is another example. We have examples everywhere. So these corporations need to figure out how to uh, do innovation uh, in a different way and how to build brands in a different way. And this is where design can play a very, very important role. Because in the past, it was all about marketing, building those amazing campaigns year on year. Today, you need to activate those brands every day uh, in a variety of different ways. So it's about creating new products, creating new packaging, creating new experiences in retail, uh, in hospitality, on the street, and then activating those brands in our case uh, in our music platforms, in our sport platforms, in uh, fashion, art, and design. Can, can you mention something that you uh, created? Yeah, okay. so let, let, let's, be, let's be very concrete. Yes. Uh, we are redesigning every single brand, so logo, visual identity system. So the first one uh, was Pepsi. I joined the company and we redesigned, we kept the logo as it was because it was redesigned a few years earlier but we redesigned completely identity systems. So different colors, uh, different presence on shelf. So that, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, a second project that we did right away that has been extremely successful, we designed these dispensers uh, for, um, essentially when you go to a restaurant, to a fast food chain, uh, you go with your cup, you put it under a machine, we call it fountain in American, uh, and you get your drink. Um, what we did, we redesigned the machine, essentially uh, adding intelligence to the machine. We, we, the new machine that we call Spire have a screen that could be the size of an iPad all the way to the size of a big television. You select your drink, you select the different, different flavors, and essentially you can customize completely your drink. Um, we have real-time information about what the people are creating, what kind of drinks they are creating, and this is all information that we send to our innovation teams for the drinks of the future we're going to retail. And then we can send information, we can send any kind of message through those machines, real time, from the center to every location around the world. Uh, we, are, are, are those dispensers already in place? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, in, in many different uh, customers' locations. And then all the way, you know, we're working, for instance, on Gatorade, uh, and this is more innovation, uh, on patches that you put on your skin. Uh, they monitor your sweat, your, um, the frequency of sweating and the composition of sweating. And we get this, this patch, uh, our smart patches that give information to a cell phone, uh, to a mobile phone uh, of, the, of the trainer of the team. For instance, we were experimenting with the um, Brazil soccer team during the World Cup and with Usain Bolt, with Serena Williams, with a variety of different star of uh, athletes that, that we work with and um, we can customize drinks on the base of their physiology 
and on the basis of the sweat rate and the sweat composition. Uh, these drinks get um, inserted in a pod with a smart bottle, and the smart bottle, every time you drink, give additional information to this app. So the trainer and the, and the physician of the team can monitor what you're drinking, the composition, the, the performance that you have, and adapt everything, both the drinks and the food on the basis of that. That's an example of innovation, for instance. It's been very successful with those athletes, and now we're rolling it out in campuses in the United States, and it will become commercial, a version of it commercial, probably towards the end of the year in the US. I was curious, you mentioned the startups are disrupting uh, uh, all different businesses. Uh, which one do, do you think of in your own uh, business that is emerging? Well, um, you know, in the past, first of all, we have many, many different brands. So there are many, many different kind of realities. Uh, in the past, in the world of the colors, it was all about this war between the, 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 the two big brands. Uh, today, you have a variety of craft sodas, for instance, uh, you have energy drinks, you have uh, natural juices, water, what is happening with water is unbelievable. Uh, water was not that relevant in, in, in this world, especially in the United States as a business. I mean, we, we still talk about billions of dollars, but it was not as, as, as relevant as it is today, just when I joined the company five years ago. Today is one of the, our key top priority. Hydration is extremely, extremely important. So, it's interesting how uh, the world is changing really, really fast at the speed of light, and, and it's difficult even to name a specific brand. You know, there is really a proliferation of different brands in different kind of categories uh, that keep arriving. Yeah. So let's go back to the origin. Uh, you mentioned Varese uh, with your mom, so you're from <laughs> Varese, right? And I was wondering if uh, that's why you love so much shoes. I read <laughs> that uh, uh, a few years ago you had a hundred pairs of shoes. Now how many do you have? Well, I, I don't count them anymore, but probably 200, 250. <laughs> well, I was thinking I was collecting shoes, meaning actually collecting is the wrong word because I just buy them and then they happen to accumulate. Uh, but then I was looking at my wardrobe, you know, jackets and trousers, and I have hundreds of all of those things. So I, I just buy, you know, l love clothing. And, but then if you, if you come to my house, for instance, uh, I collect stuff also in my house. I'm just curious and I like to buy things and discover things. This idea of discovering is something that is part of me. Um, and so shoes are, are just part of who I am, you know, the way I think. It's probably the most visible part of, of, of my clothing, because as a man, probably, you know, you can uh, be a little bit more extreme on the shoes more than in other pieces, but, but it's just part of who I am. <laughs> Great. Uh, you mentioned earlier that, uh, um, talking about the mission uh, of the Innovation Lab, you want to think differently. And also, uh, once you said that a designer is somebody who thinks differently. Can you elaborate on that? Uh, talking about the yeah, if you well. think about the, the business world, um, the people working on branding and people working on in, in innovation, mostly you have three categories. You have the marketers, marketing and sales. You have the R&D community. Uh, and then recently you have this thing called design and these designers. Um, for somebody working in marketing or in sales, um, when you are really, really happy, when, when, what is the goal that you have? The goal is to build an amazing business or eventually build an amazing brand. But it's really about selling more, making more profit, growing the business. So I usually say the marketers are the advocates of the brand and the business. Um, when you work in, uh, in R&D, as a scientist, you are driven by... Uh, the, the dream of creating something, technology that nobody ever did before, that nobody ever created before. So they're really the advocate of that technology. You become a famous scientist when you really have a new pattern, you invent something radically new. If you think about a designer, uh, the dream of a designer is to do something amazing for people. Uh, I usually say we are people in love with people. It's, you know, you want to create something cool, something that surprises people, that people can fall in love with. And, and eventually, you know, 
you can make money out of it, your company can make money out of it, but you're not driven by that. The dream of a designer is to make something that really change the world, that really change life. And, and this is the way designer thinks. And today is more important than ever because all these companies in the past had the luxury of building huge barrier to the entrance through patents, through scale, uh, branding, and media buying, and so on and so forth. Today, because of the global market, because of social media, because of the evolution of technology, this is not true anymore. You don't have those barriers to the entrance anymore, and so your product needs to be as relevant as possible, uh, as competitive as possible. The quality of that product and brand needs to be amazing, and needs to be very um, meaningful for people. And this is why these companies are realizing that designers are really, really important because we are there to design with a human-centric kind of approach for people. And when you have a very strong product, service, solution, then you, know, you build an ecosystem of communication, ecosystem a system of business around it. But you need to start with that. Mm -hmm. And this is what we do as designers. Talking about uh, human beings, uh, um, you said also that being a, a designer is uh, 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 doing a research as a designer is like being an ethnographer, uh, so studying tribes, uh, studying people. Uh, so as an ethnographer, have you found out what's the difference between the tribes uh, of uh, people who love uh, PepsiCo or the tribes who love uh, Coca-Cola, the two <laughs> great competitors? <laughs> Well, I'm not going to say anything new. Um, you know, there are the two brands have very different positions. Uh, first of all, you like the product. You may. No, no, the people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, and, and position is always related to people, right? So, um, it, first of all, you like the product. You may like, you know, Pepsi more than Coca Cola. So, there is people that are really, really passionate about the fact that they like that specific taste of Pepsi. It's very interesting. Uh, because it's also linked to the period uh, you were born on, you know, so the demography, the, the demography, the body of geography, and the, the age that you have. Like younger generations, uh, they are educating their taste in a different way, and they may like um, food and beverage in a completely different way. So it's very interesting also this. But, you know, thinking about the brand, and I think that was more of the question, and, and, and the tribe of people like the different brands, well, Coca-Cola, you know, is more family, is timeless. Uh, Pepsi is more young and re rebel, is more timely. Um, Coca-Cola is uh, Babbo Natale, is Santa Claus. Uh, Pepsi is Michael Jackson, and Cindy Crawford. Um, so there are very different kind of mindset. I think there is a, you know, in the U.S. you can do this comparative advertising, and there is one. Uh, of about, I think, 20 years ago, uh, they was comparing the two, uh, is our advertising, they was com uh, our commercial, they was comparing Pepsi and Coca-Cola, and making a little bit of fun, you know, fun of Coca-Cola, and they did many, you know, against us as well. This specific one that I think really expressed our mindset in Pepsi, um, you were in a labo laboratory, and there were all these scientists, and they had uh, these two chimpanzees and they were experimenting on them, and to one, they were, they were giving Coca-Cola, and to the other one, they were giving Pepsi. And after a few weeks, they start to see the evolution, and the one that was drinking Coca-Cola, at a certain point, he became extremely smart, and he can do math, and you know, he solve all kind of very complex mathematical problems, and all the scientists are like, oh my god, this is amazing. So they go now to the cage of the Pepsi chimpanzee, and it's not there anymore. They, they search him everywhere and they don't find it anywhere and then the the next shoot you see the chimpanzee in a convertible car by the beach with tons of beautiful women in the car having fun and i think this you know tell you a lot of the kind of mindset of the brand with all the respect for the, for the friends from atlanta but you know different kind of mindset and this is the kind of people the two brands attract i think does anybody remember that, that, that uh... google is too much fun <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I grew up um, surrounded by the paintings of my father. My father was an architect, but before being an architect, he was uh, also a painter. He, he studied art at high school and then architecture. And he's been painting all his life. And my grandfather as well. 
And so I, I, I grew up surrounded by what they were doing and experimenting with them and bothering them as much as possible, you know, trying with them, you know, the, the different techniques and everything. So that was fascinating me. The other dimension that was really fascinating me was the, the world of literature, philosophy, that was the passion of my mother. My mother was, uh, she was working in finance, but their passion was really, really literature, reading. Uh, so uh, I was influenced by those two worlds. At school I was doing very well in a little bit, you know, in all the different disciplines, but my passions were those two. And so at a certain point I had to decide which of the two, to, um, what, what to study. And I decided to go for design mostly because I was thinking it was, giving, it was going to give me more opportunity for a job. And I really needed to work. <laughs> I was coming from a you know, normal, humble family, so I really needed a job where thinking it was giving me more opportunity. And actually, I decided to study architecture. And then a few days before doing the test, a friend of mine from high school called me. And he was like, you know that they opened just this new faculty within architecture and engineering called design. In Italian, disegno industriale. And I had no clue. Disegno industriale, it was not in English. It was called disegno industriale. So in Italian, it sounds like designing machinery or things like this. But I could, do, I could have done the first year there and then moved to architecture. So I decided, OK, let's try the test. So that was the first year of design at the Polytechnic? Yeah, it was the second one. So it was the first ever University of Design in Italy. That is unbelievable because we have so many amazing designers in Italy. But usually we joke, those are all architects frustrated. They couldn't do architecture in Italy because too many policies, too much art. You know, you really couldn't do it. So they decided to become designers, different scale. But yes, and so it was amazing because, bec because it was the first university, there were so many amazing, amazing designers that would come there and teach to these younger people to really educate and form the first real designers, you know. Uh, and, and so I found it, it was a five years university. Back then it was still, you know, the, the five years altogether. And already the third year I had a job. I was, still, you know, I was the cultura della materia, assistant teacher because they were taking you know, the, 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 the best talent and they were using them right away. Did you have uh, famous mentors? Or yeah. Um, For example? Well, um, I had famous teachers uh, like... So we are talking about the Politecnico di Milano. Of the yeah. Day, right? So at school I had people like Branzi, that is history of Italian design, uh, Macchio Zwicke, maybe is less renowned, but is just, you know, MH uh, way, he, he built a brand in Italy that is really, really important, and many, many products that are part of our everyday life, and many others. Um, but then outside of the school, uh, but in the Milan environment, I, I found two amazing mentors. One uh, was Stefano Marzano, that was the head of design, essentially my role now in Philips. So an Italian that was working in, uh, in Holland, and it was really revolutionizing the way of doing design in consumer electronics. Um, the other one was immediately after the university was Claudio Cecchetto, the show business producer. Uh, I met Claudio um, when was, I was 24. Uh, I was working in Philips, just out of school. And we, he had a partnership with um, Tiscali, with Soru. Uh, he had a company with Soru from Tiscali. The, the first internet provider in Italy. Yeah, one of, uh, back then was the biggest in Europe as well. Um, and um, essentially Claudio was really, really intrigued by the world of internet and digital. Now, for the people that don't know Claudio Cecchetto, uh, he's an amazing show business producer. He started as a DJ, but then he created the most important Italian radio, Radio DJ, the first uh, music format in television, a DJ television. Uh, then he sold uh, radio, uh, radio DJ, he built Radio Capital, and many, many of the stars in, uh, in Italy, music stars or presenters, were actually created by him, from Giovanotti, Ototo Tre, uh, Jerry Scotti, Fabio Volo, I mean, many that people don't associate with Claudio Cecchetto were totally invented by, by this person. What he gave me, so I, long story short, we made a company together. Um, we had a company together for three years, from when I was 24 to when I was 27. Wiseman, yeah. 
And we, we, you know, as a, as a kid, I was fascinated by the possibility of working with some of these music celebrities. And we were working on their identity. They were starting to have CDs instead of cassette CDs with the digital content inside. So we were designing the image of the CD. We were designing, well, you know, that digital content. So for us, it was really, really cool. And I remember Claudio telling us, guys, fine, but this is just a service to somebody, and it's good because we get some cash you know, to, for the company. But what we need to do is to innovate, is to do something that nobody ever did before, something that is priceless, something that will change the world. He had this kind of mindset to the extreme. The guy, uh, he, he arrived almost to be self-destructive for how much he, he was trying to innovate and innovate and innovate. But he gave me this, at 24, to have somebody that every single day for three years tell you, you need to innovate, you need to innovate. He, he, he gave me that kind of mindset that then I took to 3M, I took to PepsiCo. Everything I do needs to be innovative, in a way or the other. It doesn't need to change the world, but you know, even in the small things, you can disrupt and change. And that's, that's Claudio. Um, can you compare the education you got from the Politecnico uh, of Milan to uh, what you see from the younger generation uh, people working with you now? Um, you know, I, it, it, Politecnico was, as I told you, the second year, and it was a mess. It was really a mess. They were trying to figure out exactly um, what, what, to, what to teach. Uh, the different teachers were coming from engineering, and they were coming, like, I, I will give you just an example. Um, the semio we were studying semiotic. Semiotic in design is really the study of the different signs, the codes. Uh, so it's really about graphic elements, graphic signs. Um, but the teacher was a teacher that was coming from literature, Bonfantini. He was a very, he was a famous semiologist. And, and so I, w I love literature. So my thesis in semiotic, in design, was on the irony in Madame Bovary. It just <laughs> that has nothing to do <laughs> with, with, design. With, with design. But so I, I, I mentioned this because it, it was a mess to really try to find your way. And then has been helping me a lot because it, it taught me to uh, work in the complexity, in an environment that is moving, that is difficult to define. And so a lot of people actually got lost in that mess. Mm -hmm. uh, but for us, it was a very, very important school. Um, another thing that I think was uh, unique of, of that kind of university, and the fact that it's a university I think is very important versus just a school, uh, is that the preparation was very, very broad. I mean, we'll study mathematics, physics, but the basic, not applied to design, material science, and then macroeconomics, business, you know, marketing, uh, semiotic in the way I describe, and that really opened up my mind. Uh, and it's very, very important because to be a designer is not just about being able to design this glass in three dimension or a beautiful graphic, but it's really about understanding people. It's understanding culture, it's understanding society, it's understanding where the world is going. And so you need to be curious, you need to be an ethnographer 24 seven. And then once you understand that, you will find a solution to satisfy people's needs and people's dreams uh, that often are not even articulated. So before anything else, you are a sort of psychologist, ethnographer, human scientist. And once you understand that, then you need to have all the technical background to translate that into something. It could be a product, could be a brand, could be a service, could be an architecture, could be an experience. Mm -hmm. uh, so after Wise Man, you joined uh, a multinational, American one, uh, 3M. Uh, why? Because, well, after Wiseman, um, you know, the internet after the boom went down. It was, it was too early. It was uh, 2002. 2002. Mm -hmm. And so I found another, I, I'm an entrepreneur inside. Uh, and I found another, um, somebody else that could fund another studio that I wanted to build. And I started to build this studio in Switzerland. Uh, and it was very close. Varese, my city was 10 kilometers from the border with Switzerland. Um, and then 3M arrived, and they arrived because uh, back then I was working on 
uh, my thesis with Philips was on wearable technologies, and then the Louvre Museum selected me as one of the young designers to expose my products in um, in an exhibit there, and then I, and then we went to Seoul for at the Art Center, and I used some of the 3M technologies in these products, and and when 3M decided to uh, hire a head of design for the consumer business in Europe. I was one of the names that was top of mind for them. Uh, the reason why I joined is, you know, I went to the interview not interested at all. And I was just curious. I went, and then I realized the amazing brands that they had and the amazing technologies that they had, and mostly the fact that they had no clue what design, what design was. So for many people, I think that would have been a deterrent. It would have been a reason for not to join. For me, it was the reason to join. I was like, gosh, they're giving me an opportunity, amazing, at 27, to be the head of design of the consumer business in Europe without even realizing what they're doing, else they wouldn't have done, you know, gone, uh, given uh, something like this to a kid like this. Uh, and this is my opportunity to do what Stefano Marzano did in Philips on my own way in this organization. And, and you know, in, to be honest, that was a very naive dream. It was the, I always say, it, it was the dream of a, uh, the naive dream of a kid, but if you don't have a dream, you'll never be able to realize it, to make it, right? So every time I speak to young generation, young people, I remember I was speaking, for instance, in, in Minnesota, to the in the University of Minnesota, the commencement speech, I always tell this story, this story of, of dreaming. Dream, have naive dream, because else you'll never be able to to make them happen. And so after 10 years then, I became the chief design officer of the company. The first one also. At the, the first one at 3M as well. And, and really they, they understood design, they embraced design, they built a design center in, uh, uh, in, uh, in St. Paul, um, in Minnesota. They, we opened design centers all around the world, from Shanghai to Tokyo, Milan. We were opening when I left um, in Sao Paulo. So the, the, the company embraced design uh, as never before. Uh, so for 3M, at a certain point, you moved uh, to a suburb uh, in Minneapolis, and uh, I read that you kind of shocked your neighbors because you put uh, a <laughs> pink lion uh, in, uh, in your front yard, a lion that you painted yourself. Pink. Yeah, I'm laughing because uh, the guy that lives in Minnesota is the former head of design of Best Buy, and now he's the uh, chairman of the board of Buffalo Wild Wings uh, in Minnesota, and... and an amazing, amazing designer. So we're looking at each other because we know me. He's from here, but he lives in Minnesota. So we know that world. <laughs> so so uh, you moved from Milan, where you breed the design, to the suburb with the pink lion. So How tough was it? Yeah, I, I actually loved it. When, when I moved there, uh, a lot of people told me, if you resist three, four years, then you never want to leave Minnesota. Um, I, I didn't resist, I left. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I would have stayed. Uh, I had a really, really uh, great time. Um, first of all, 25 of the Fortune 100 are based there in Minnesota. Probably it's so cold that what can you do? You, you need to work, right? No, but the, you know, the people, really good people, you know, uh, an amazing place, nature, no traffic. I mean, the life is, is easy. Uh, um, but then, you know, I was traveling a lot, so I, I will get a lot of stimuli uh, outside of, of Minnesota. I think one of the things that was worrying me the most was that, um, you know, you are not surrounded by the stimuli that you can find in big capitals like New York or Paris or Milan or London every time you just walk in the street, uh, just in terms of the palette of colors, just the colors, you know, you go in these places, it's all creamy and... Uh, and so it's, it, it's dangerous for creativity. But if you travel, you know, you can keep that kind of uh, cre creative level high. Um, but but I, I think things are evolving also in, in, in that part of the world. I, I think that really design is starting to, to spread a little bit everywhere. About the lion, um, you know, the lion, I found a lion on the street in a sales on the street. It was not pink, it was a normal lion. I was like, gosh, that reminds me of, of the lions of Venice, you know, that icon of Italian architecture, Italian sculpture. So I was like, I'm gonna buy it. Uh, it's a little bit of me being Italian, then I'm gonna paint it fuchsia, you know, this pink fuchsia. 
because it's me being a designer and try, and try to provoke. And then I'm going to put it in my neighbor. I was living in this Jewish neighborhood in front of the country club where everybody was, you know, very Polish. And here I arrived with this pink lion. But the, everybody loved it. People were stopping to take pictures with the lion. <laughs> and, and, so, and then Fast Company, when they made me Master of Design, they fell in love with the lion as well. They, I had these two pages, you know, with me and my and my ex-wife uh, on top of the lion, and and then it became a little bit of my my icon. I, I would meet people at conferences around the world, and people would be like, "Oh my God, but you're the guy of the lion." <laughs> so yeah, and then and then when you moved here to New York, you said uh, that you would bring the lion with you because the lion is me. Yeah, I mean, it became a little bit of, a, of an icon, of a brand. Uh, at, at the end of the day, we are brands as well. We can manage ourselves as brands as well. And I think to find ways to, uh, that are very intuitive, very easy, very Im immediate to, to, to talk about you and who you are uh, is part of your, of your brand. And that it was not by design. It just happened to me. But the lion became a little bit me, so I'm taking it everywhere. It, what, what is it? Is in my house in the Hamptons, controlling my pool. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, at your house in the Hamptons, uh, you have also a black dinosaur. Yeah, now? it's three weeks old. It's growing. <laughs> 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 I bought it three weeks ago. Uh, it was not black. I made it black to make it to make him stylish. Um, it was a dinosaur, really, with the colors of a dinosaur. It's a, it's a Rex, right? It I don't I know think, exactly yeah. what it is. No, it's a very weird name, you know, uh, the technical name is not, it's not a T-Rex, it's a different one, but essentially when, uh, if you go to the Hamptons, at a certain point on the only street to enter the Hamptons where you're in Southampton, there is this store that I love, deeply, deeply love. It's a vintage store that has all kinds of crazy things, and it has all these statues of dinosaurs, elephants, monsters there on the street. So, Everybody sees that when you, when you pass by. I really, I, I take everybody there because then you go inside, it's, it's very big, and you can find all kinds of things. I remember once I bought a lithography of Picasso at the gallery uh, here in, um, in, in Seoul. And then three days later, I happened to go in the store. Uh, and there were all these paintings on the, on, on the floor, uh, and I look some of them, and the owner arrives is like, oh yeah, this, you know, there is Britain Picasso, but not Picasso, it's the uh, grand-nephew, uh, granddaughter of Picasso. And in fact, if you look at the signature, it was very different than the signature of Picasso, but she was still bright, just Picasso, nothing else. <laughs> so, you know, s somehow misleading people. But then I see one that had the real signature of Picasso. And I knew because I was fresh of studying, you know, three days earlier. And so I'm like, so they're all from the granddaughter. It's like, yeah, yeah, they're all from the granddaughter. So I see this one, I turn, and there was still an article. Of, first of all, there was the folder where you put the guarantee of the painting, but there was not a guarantee inside. And then there was uh, an article from the auction where it was sold. Uh, I, don't rem I saw the B or I don't remember where. Um, long story short, uh, I, there was a 50% on all the paintings. Uh, so I'm like, so this is in sale, and, and, and he told me, no, this is a lithography, it's not a painting, so it's not in sale. So I'm like, okay, then I'm not interested. <laughs> and so, it, and he was like, okay, I give it 50% off. So I bought this Picasso for $200 <laughs> in that place. Uh, and, but anyway, that's the story, but I bought tons of stuff. I bring all my friends every time there, everybody visiting. So few after five years, four years that I had the house in the Hamptons, a uh, few weeks ago, I always wanted to buy a, a dinosaur. You know, I felt in love with that place, and that, the symbol of that place is the dinosaur. And the dinosaur is also, you know, when I was a kid, I would play with all these dinosaurs. I would watch cartoons, very violent cartoons with all these dinosaurs. So a little bit, you know, reminds me of my childhood, and so I decided to buy one, yeah. and then paint in black and place it in my garden. Now it's guarding my garden. It's going to become a zoo. No, I, I, we stop there, I promise. <laughs> okay. We are at the limit of being kitsch. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you joined the Pepsi in 2012, and that was a year of transition for Pepsi, uh, so the company wrote it on uh, the website, and in fact, uh, uh, that, uh, that same year, they cut uh, 8,000 
700 jobs, 3% of the total uh, workforce. And at, at the same time, they invested uh, an additional 500 to 600 million in advertising, uh, marketing, uh, and, and so on. So how did you fit into this transition at PepsiCo? Um, I was part of the project. Uh, it was driven by Indra Nui, by our amazing uh, CEO. Uh, and essentially, she was trying to redesign the company. Um, as soon as she took the position, she introduced this idea a few years before that. She introduced this idea of performance with purpose, per financial performance with a purpose that is social, uh, linked to social sustainability, and then uh, the purpose of our products, making our products healthier. Um, and, and that kind of change, that kind of shift was linked to that, to build new brands, new products, essentially to drive innovation, build a global company with the global organizations. So I was part of that, but, and I read the same before joining the company, and for me it was very important because uh, when a CEO goes in front of Wall Street and the shareholders and commit to that kind of change, then she needs to deliver results. And, and so it was a moment where the company needed to change, you know, because of this commitment, they couldn't fool around, they had to change. And so to enter and becoming one of the change agents and one of the new assets to leverage, uh, to drive the company in a different direction was, was perfect as timing. And in fact, she, she succeeded. I mean, the, our stock, our, the performance of our company has been very, very good in the past few years. And this is all because of the vision of the woman. Mm -hmm. Great. One of the few women uh, uh, on top of uh, big uh, companies. And non-American. Woman and non-American. Yeah. So it's an um, interesting Amazing. sign. Yeah. Uh, one of the drivers of uh, uh, changing everywhere is our social media. Uh, how do you deal uh, with social media? I'm obsessed by social media. <laughs> I'm very active in social media. Now, my job wouldn't exist uh, in if social media didn't exist. It wouldn't exist as it is today. Essentially, social media, you know, these companies were building brands by crafting a content and with a communication top-down, almost imposing the content uh, through TV channels and then uh, a, a system of communication around the TV to consumers. So they were the actor of this conversation. Today, they're not the actors anymore. They are the topic of the conversation among people in social media. And so we're, they're moving from buying the right to be part of the conversation to the need of earning the right. And how do you earn the right? By being relevant to people and by creating content. And this is where the, the situation is shifting from a marketing-driven approach to the brand building and innovation to a more design-driven approach, where essentially, you need designers to create stuff, to create uh, limited edition cans, to create partnership and collection, uh, partnership with fashion celebrities to create collections of fashions inspired by the world of Pepsi, uh, to create amazing experiences in the world of music, to create innovation with Usain Bolt and Serena Williams, like the one I described you earlier with Gatorade, uh, is, is about really keeping creating content in a variety of different ways, innovative content. Uh, and, and this is really driven by this world that is changing. Global world, internet, but social media are really playing a very, very, very important role in this. Let's talk about politics. Mm. Uh, I'm not an expert, by the way. <laughs> However, I was very uh, uh, impressed by a, a post that you published uh, uh, on your uh, blog or something. Um, after the election of Donald Trump. Uh, so the, the, the headline of the post was uh, um, uh, a brand plus design plus innovation lesson from the presidential election. And I read uh, a, a short uh, excerpt. When a good majority of people is extremely vocal about a point of view, the rest of the population may be reluctant to express and share their thinking. This may blind the entirety of the group and lead them to take the wrong assumptions. We see this happening every day in consumer research during the innovation, design, and branding processes." Unquote. So can you elaborate on that? Well, first of all, um, it, the post was very apolitical, and it was more an analysis of what happened that I think was shocking. 
Um, what happened is that the vast majority of the worldwide population was thinking that Hillary Clinton was going to win. And we were thinking that because of what we were reading and in social media and what the media were telling us. So essentially, we were living in this artificial world created um, by both you know, top-down, by certain kind of medias, and bottom-up, by conversations online. And we were really believing that, that 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 was the world we were living in. And then all of a sudden, there, is, there are the results of the election, and we have this aha moment that we live in a completely different world. It's unbelievable. Thank God there was that aha moment, because God knows how many other situations we live in where we think that that's the world that we live in, and in reality is not at all, and there won't be an election to wake us up and say, no, we live in a world that is completely different. Now, you know, if you take it to the next level, what happened there? What happened is that in social media, first of all, the most vocal population in social media are Gen Y and Gen Z. So already a part of the population. Baby boomers are by far less vocal than the younger generation. So it's already a part of the, of the um, a fraction of the population. Then there are some that are by far more vocal, more loud in expressing their point of views than others. Uh, and when that kind of point of view eventually is the right one that you want to hear because it's ethical, because it's good, because it sounds, you know, good for the world and the society, the others don't speak up. And so you find yourself with a small percentage of the population. In the case, it was not that small. It was still, you know, huge, but still smaller versus the, the rest of the, of the population uh, that is talking, and there is not a counterpart. And this happened to us over and over and over um, when we design brands and we test brands. Uh, from a focus group where you may have 10 people around the table and there may be a couple that are really, really vocal and the others feel very uncomfortable to express their opinion. And so you think that those two you know, are expressing the opinion of everybody else. In reality, you may have eight that are totally in disagreement, but they don't talk. Maybe also because that disagreement you know, is something... For instance, I remember when, we were, when I was working at 3M and we were designing safety helmets and safety equipment for people in, a, in factories. Um, nobody wanted to admit, those workers, those macho workers, they didn't want to admit that they wanted to have fancy sunglasses, I mean, safety glasses, fancy uh, uh, earmuffs. They didn't want to say it. But in reality, they were buying those kind of products. So often, uh, you don't want to say something because you think it's not good. Few say the right thing, you know, that everybody want to hear, and this is misleading completely. Uh, Everything. So we need to be very, very careful. We see this also uh, in our products, in our category, in food and beverage, um, where there is a lot, you know, a lot of conversations about certain category of food and beverage that everybody is pushing. When in reality, then you see consumption data and people buy completely different kind of stuff. So uh, it's a very interesting. You know, we really, really need to understand between the line and beyond, you know, what people say. But in the end, you discovered it uh, uh, by the consumers, uh, what they buy, really. Yeah. 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 In, the, in the case, we are lucky again, because there is that uh, proof point at the end, like in the case of the elections. But God knows how many situations you know, there are where we think that that's the reality, and the reality is completely different. So I think my, my point in that post was also, let's keep always the antenna up and be very critical, you know, have always a critical mind and not accept, you know, what you read, but really try to understand what there is behind. Yeah. Um, in our previous conversations, I always ask uh, uh, the other top managers uh, if uh, being Italian was a handicap for them uh, in their international career. Uh, of course, for a designer, uh, being Italian uh, uh, was a plus for you, right? Yeah, yeah. The Italian accent helps. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, um, so it's something that I'm leveraging in a very conscious way. Uh, like 3M, for instance, gave me the possibility to do English lessons. And, you know, I could have done it to tweak a little bit my accent. I decided not to do it to keep my accent. Um, so somehow, you know, I'm leveraging this. But then you need to be able to integrate that exotic, you know, um, approach with the American culture, with the culture we live in, you know, in, in, um, and, and this is really important, and they think this is 
the big opportunity uh, for Italian designers in general, how to find a way to create a different kind of dialogue with the Anglo-Saxon business system. Uh, because today is almost not existing. You know, I'm, I'm in love with Italy. Or the, uh, I have many, many uh, designers in Italy that are very close friends of mine. Uh, and they have a very, very hard time interacting with these American companies in general, and especially then with the big corporations. So, uh, you know, they, they are Italian. What's, what's the problem? The problem is, um, is the difference between the two cultures. Um, the Italian approach to design uh, is very visceral, um, is very intuitive. Uh, the American one is more strategic, is more rational. Um, in America, the Anglo-Saxon design is linked to in the industry, it's very industrial, it's, it was born with the industry. The Italian one was born um, closer to the world of art, it has a social point of view. If you think about archi zoom in the 80s, for instance, in design, or you think about architecture in the 70s, there was always a social point of view, almost political. Um, so, uh, are very, very different approaches to design, and the reality is that both cultures need each other. Essentially, the American one today needs a little bit more that intuitive, visceral um, um, approach to creativity, uh, and, the Ameri and the Italian one needs to be more strategic, more process-oriented, uh, able to scale up. Uh, this is this is not just design. You know, we are we have these amazing uh, small, medium, small enterprises uh, where essentially you have an, an, a great visionary, an entrepreneur. Then you have the most of the time a creative person, and then you have a third entity that nobody ever talk about, but is the technologist and the manufacturer that make the dreams of the other two possible and come to life. Um, and the American system essentially is able to translate those conversations among the three people into processes, organizations, and systems. Um, and so uh, the problem often that we have in Italy is to how to scale up, how to delegate those kind of conversations, how to translate those conversations in big organizations. This is a problem that we have. Uh, in America, they were really, really good at doing that. The problem is that when you scale, 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 you, you risk to lose the soul of those conversations, the, you know, the spark of creativity. So how to try to leverage both approaches is what I've been trying to do in, in this year in, um, in, in PepsiCo. This morning, before coming here, we had this people planning. We are essentially, people planning is when we review all the organization reporting to me with the uh, HR and my leadership team, and we talk about the high potential and you know, the, uh, the bench for the top uh, executive positions and the future of the organization from a people and cultural standpoint. And, and we were talking about um, you know, processes, approaches, and so on and so forth. But then we were talking also about something that American corporations don't want to talk about that is the subjectivity of people, the taste, for instance, of people. Uh, you know, we, w there are designers that have an amazing taste, very sophisticated, and others that eventually don't, even if they study design. So it's very difficult for a company uh, to, uh, to say, okay, you don't have taste, you know. Well, it, it happened in fashion. In fashion, you know, if, you, if you're not good, if you don't have taste, you're out. <laughs> Uh, in other companies, not, because there is that element of subjectivity that is so, so difficult to deal with, to, to measure, to, to manage. And, and this really, you know, in, in Italy, the subjective approach, the passion, the love, uh, is part of our culture. And, and when you start to talk about processes, uh, structures, and organizations, and um, it, it's very difficult to manage that part but it's so important today. So we need to introduce that into the American system. And in the meantime, if Italy would, you know, our Italian system, not just designers, but you know, the, 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 the business, the enterprises, will be able to really think more strategically in scale, uh, to delegate, to organize, to structure, to process, we could do miracles in this, in this world we live in. Yeah. Um, well, talking about uh, Chief Design Officers, the most famous is uh, uh, John, uh, 
Johnny Ive at Apple, of course. Yeah. Uh, so there were rumors some times ago that he may be leaving Apple. Uh, would you dream to take his place? I, don't, I mean, I, I'm very happy, you know, with what I'm doing. If, you know, I've been thinking a lot in the past years, well, what's next uh, after PepsiCo? And, and the reality is that this company is giving me the possibility to do innovation, to work on entertainment, essentially, because some of these brands are celebrity brands, to move from brand building uh, to the more traditional, once again, industrial design innovation uh, approach. Um, is, is giving me a lot of resources and the freedom to do really amazing things. Um, so I'm, I'm happy where I am. Um, then in the future, you know, if when I will stop having the kind of challenges that the company is giving me, those opportunities the company is giving me, if it will ever happen, I may consider other companies. Obviously, Apple is an amazing company um, as well. Um, but in any case, forget the brand or the product. It needs to be a company that it will give me the possibility to disrupt, to do something really new, really uh, unique. And so if that company is Apple, it needs to be an Apple where there are the right conditions to change the game once again. Mm -hmm. And by the way, it wouldn't be easy because Apple has been doing amazing things <laughs> so far. Yeah. Uh, by the way, Apple tried already many, many years ago to hire a, an Italian designer and architect, Bellini. Uh, they say, he, he's, he's, he told the story, Bellini himself, that uh, Steve Jobs uh, called him and uh, asked him to join Apple, but he couldn't because he had a contract with uh, uh, Olivetti at that time. And uh, Bellini was the designer of P101 that we hosted here a couple of years ago at the exhibition uh, Make in Italy. P101 was the, uh, called the first personal computer in, uh, in the world. Uh, and uh, it is uh, uh, at the MoMA, um, together with many other uh, innovations uh, made by Italians. Uh, do you have a um, special uh, Italian uh, uh, piece of design that you uh, Love particularly uh, um, in the history. Well, there are many. Um, by the way, you, you know, there is not even the design design collection is not exposed at the moment anymore. They decided to embed it inside a variety of different collections. This is very interesting. Uh, how museums are changing and how they are trying to hybridize different media, formal products into different kind of stories. Um, if, if, I think at, if I think about at, at the MoMA collection, um, the, in the, what was 1972 Italian landscape, domestic landscape was really uh, a landmark uh, for Italian design in the United States and, and, and the history of design in general. Uh, and linked to that, there are many, many iconic products like, I don't know, the Arco, uh, of Castiglioni, the lamp that now has been copied in all possible ways with a marble base, you know, that is, a, is, is just an icon. Icon is the right word. Um, or um, to thinking about Italian design history, uh, the work of Sapper at Zanuso for Brion Vega, uh, like, you know, the Cubo the television uh, or, the, or the radio, I think. Uh, the radio. The, well, there is the radio, there are two different TVs. It was really pioneer, you know, they, they were pioneers at, at, at their age, and it's amazing still today what they did. But thinking about today, um, it's not design, it's art, but I think there is a very interesting provocation of probably uh, the most famous Italian artist at the moment, that is Catellan, um, here um, at the Whitney, I think it is, the gold toilet. It's at the Guggenheim. Oh, the Guggenheim, the Guggenheim, Guggenheim. you're right. Has, has anybody tried it here? <laughs> no? And, and it's called lines. Gold Toilet called lines. America, by the way, and, and in perfect style of Maurizio. And, and that's an interest. I mean, uh, it, that's an Italian artist that is able to really have the world, no matter your background, talking about what you do, your provocation, and, you know, with a very specific point of view. So I, I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that Maurizio Catellani is an Italian and, in, and of what he's doing in, you know, in a variety of different contexts. We uh, worked with him last year for, with PepsiCo during the Milan Design Week. We did a few things together. I love him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, one of the new things that you did uh, with Pepsi is the Cola House. I don't know if uh, anybody knows about it. It's a new restaurant uh, downtown. Uh, so what is the purpose of a Pepsi restaurant? Do you serve only Frito-Lays, uh, <laughs> chips, and... Uh, we, don't, we, we, don't sell, we don't sell chips, and we have Pepsi, but is almost invisible in reality. Well, Colaos exists because of the social media world we were talking about earlier. Um, it wouldn't make sense um, for a company like PepsiCo to invest money in something like this. It wouldn't have made sense a few years ago. Um, what is Colaos? Colaos is a space, is a restaurant, club, um, where you have a product experience. You have these cocktails that we designed with a renowned mixologist. Uh, based on cola nut, not on cola, but on cola nut. And this is real about romancing the idea of colas, the cola nuts, that is one of the ingredients of colas, and nobody knows. So well, the idea is, is, is a nut, is a nut, a nut of cola. So it's, it's really about you know, celebrating one of the ingredients, having people talking about this, uh, every, you know, nobody really knows. So it's, a, it's about activating that kind of conversation about the product, so we don't serve colas. Uh, we serve this kind of cocktails. And then, you know, the world, our world of colas and Pepsi is a world of music, is a world of entertainment. So it's a space where we, we can reconfigure the space and we, we organize concerts, we organize fashion shows, art shows. So it's really embodying what Pepsi and what our company in the world of colas stand for. And the idea is not to have the brand on your face, but to have the brand very subtly embedded in, inside the experience and the space so that people can talk about us. We don't talk about colas, we want people to talk about colas. And so how do you observe the reactions? Only through social media or you watch I'm always there, I mean, dinner with my friends, but <laughs> no, no, we, we, we use social media, that is very, very important, but then obviously we observe through our staff what's going on, how they react to the drinks, the cocktails, the experiences, uh, but social media is the most important um, way, to. way to monitor it. Yeah. Yeah. So my last question is about uh, a big dream of yours uh, that you again uh, wrote in a post uh, on your Facebook page, uh, I think, last month. Uh, it was a long post about a lunch you had with the former Italian uh, uh, Prime Minister uh, Matteo Renzi. So uh, I quote what he wrote. Um, uh, we talked about Italy as a cultural brand made of assets like our fashion and design, our history, art, architecture, literature, geography, our food, our unique technologies. And uh, uh, we talked about, of a, uh, about a better, happier, more sustainable Italy that is about to come if, if we are just able to all work together to make it happen and if we finally decide to embrace collaboration, system thinking, celebration of each other's success, optimism, and international dialogue as our new keywords. Do you really think it can happen? And yeah. how can you contribute to this? I, I think it can happen. It's a conversation actually I had with Matteo also here at the consulate um, a few months ago. Um, I think it can happen because I see, for instance, how, you know, I will start from another example and then I will get there. Uh, the world, how the world of food and beverage is changing radically uh, because of the new generations. You know, these you know, kids are eating and drinking in a healthier way. And they're doing it because of the education of the families, because of the, the school system, because of a culture that we are creating for them. And so they're growing with a completely different kind of approach to food and beverage. And so we see the change in, in, you know, happening very, very fast. The world of food and beverage that there is today, and the world of food and beverage of five years ago when I, when I joined PepsiCo is radically different in just five years. So if it can happen there, that is really what we eat and drink every single day. Why cannot happen you know, in a country? Now, every single word in that post was you know, taught and calculated. Um, for that to happen, I, I, the, 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 the problems I think we have as a culture, as a country, is our inability to do system, to work together. 
we are just unable to do it. Think about the um, industry of furniture, you know, with the Brianza and our, you know, our tradition in the world of furniture, and then IKEA arrives, you know, and, and does what they do. Fashion, same thing, H&M, Zara, or the, you know, the big fashion brands, many of them were bought by, <laughs> by the French, by other um, organizations in other countries. So we are unable to work together. Um, we are unable to celebrate the success of others. We need to take them down each and every time. Well, in the US, there is such a respect for success. You may like or not like the person, but you respect what the person achieved. Um, and then there is this uh, continuous whining, complaining about the situation, uh, instead of you know, a more optimistic kind of approach of, OK, this is how we can solve the problems that we have. And you know, looking at things from these global corporations, where essentially we do reviews all around the world, in different countries of the world, this becomes very, very evident. Because one day I'm in Italy, the other day I'm in France, the other day I'm in China. So I see how the different teams react to problems. And Italy has that kind of approach. And it's not just me. I mean, both at 3M, in PepsiCo, everybody was seeing this. So these are things that we can change. If in the schools, we teach our kids to celebrate the success of, their, you know, of the other kids in the class, to work together each and every time, uh, to, instead of complaining, have an attitude to problem solving, we can change in a few years. Now, what is the real problem, though? That to do that, we need the baby boomers, we need our Gen X, our generations, to teach this to them. And before even doing that, we need to be aware that this is a problem. And if you are within that kind of context and you don't get out and you don't look things from outside, it's very difficult to realize the problems that we have you know, as a country, as a culture. Because you think it, it is the result of the world we live in, the, the economic crisis, and so on and so forth. When in reality, if you look from outside, you see how other countries are reacting to the same kind of situation in a completely different way. So I think, yeah. I think so, things can change. Yeah. So you personally, if uh, 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 next uh, uh, prime minister uh, 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 from Italy would uh, ask you to become the chief designer officer of Italy, renew the brand, would you go back to Italy to do that? Um, I may. I don't know. I mean, I, as I told you earlier, I, I'm having a lot of fun in PepsiCo. It's giving me really an amazing stage to, to change many things uh, um, in, in the world, uh, in the categories we play in. So uh, I'm loyal also to, you know, I'm not a career designer. I'm not a designer that's moving from one company to the other to make more money. I'm, I'm really a dreamer trying to really change things. And that's why usually I'm loyal to companies that give me a stage to really change the game. Um, but it doesn't mean that, you know, if there is a beautiful, amazing project, you know, I, I wouldn't consider it. Okay, great. I think that uh, we learned a lot. We, we learned, first of all, what is a CDO of, <laughs> of a company like Pepsi. So thank you so much, Mauro, for your time. Thank you for coming here. And uh, Thank you. Thank you for the invite.